is the is uh, two discrete time systems. What Laplace transform is continuous time systems. And so um, we'll just uh, list the definition of Z transform X of Z or the Z transform of X of N is just the sum from minus infinity to infinity of X of N times Z to the minus N. We won't say anything about what Z is at this point. It's just like S and Laplace in that sense. Uh, it's a variable and it can be complex valued. And so uh, the formula uh, means exactly what it says. So if here's my sequence X of N down below, I multiply X of zero by Z zero. I multiply X of one by Z to the minus one. I multiply X of two by Z to the minus two. I multiply X of minus one by Z to the minus one. Uh, kind of indicating a multiply there, not the X itself. Um, and so then uh, you add all those together. Uh, and that's the important thing to do is you start working with these. You have X of dot, 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 X of minus one, Z to the one plus X of zero, Z to the zero plus X of one, Z to the minus one plus X of two, Z to the minus two, and so forth. Um, until you uh, get a good sense for this, it's not a bad idea to write these out as you first see them. Um, so again, Z transform uh, is very similar to Laplace transform in, in, its, in that it can be thought of as the Laplace transform of digital systems. So, so it serves a central and important role. Um, the, it, there's also a one-sided Z transform, which is restricted to causal or what are called right-sided sequences. They only exist from zero and up. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, the value is zero to the left, um, or X of N is zero for values of N less than zero. Um, we can decide uh, <clears throat> define this one-sided Z transform as a sum from zero to infinity, uh, X of N Z to the minus N. So, uh, Instead of minus infinity to infinity in the definition for the two-sided on the previous page, it has uh, one-sided. So it's similar to the one-sided Laplace, uh, and it has an inverse transform, uh, which is a complex integral. Now it's in the Z plane, since we uh, work with X of Z here. Uh, just as in Laplace, typically you don't do that. Uh, transform uh, to you would rather use a lookup table uh, to do the inverse transform. So we typically don't do that integral, although you can do it with complex mathematics. So the two-sided Z-transform, um, again, is similar to the uh, two-sided Laplace. Um, the condition, again, is that the two-sided Z-transform must include that region of convergence. So we'll see in a, an example where two different uh, signals have the same uh, function x of z, but the region of convergence is different. So to make it unique and one-to-one, -one, you must include the region of convergence. Um, and just as the region of convergence is where x of z exists in the z-plane, um, it's similar to the region of convergence we discussed uh, where the Laplace transform x of s exists in the Laplace plane. Um, so uh, we're going to focus more on using uh, the two-sided Z-transform because that's most common in, in the signal processing world. Um, and we'll see uh, on a K in some examples that it does offer uh, some advantages. And so the key difference is now minus infinity, infinity, um, but you must also include the ROC uh, along with the X of Z that you may solve. Uh, and the inverse transform uh, is the same. It's the uh, contour integral uh, inside the region of convergence. Um, again, typically you would use um, the Laplace tab uh, Z transform table rather than doing an inverse integral. Um, <clears throat> Z transform visualization, um, kind of an important reminder. Often you'll look at the Z plane where you just look at the real part of Z 
and the imaginary part of Z, uh, similar to the real and imaginary part of S. Uh, but it's important to remember um, that this is the argument of X of Z. It's the real and imaginary parts of the variable. Um, but also X of Z itself, um, it's also going to have uh, a real and imaginary part. And so uh, it's a four dimensional thing where Z has two dimensions and X of Z has two dimensions. And so typically uh, you might plot uh, in three dimensions, this surface uh, would be plotted above the Z plane to indicate, let's say the magnitude of uh, X of Z. Uh, and so a reminder that when you look at the Z plane, let's say if I have a pole in the Z plane, that pole just means that there's a third dimension sitting above that point in the plane that would have an infinitely high uh, point. Um, <clears throat> and so just a reminder uh, that uh, in the Z plane and the Laplace plane, uh, they're only telling part of the picture. Uh, you can visualize that they're telling you something happening in the third dimension. Um, <clears throat> so Z transform uh, is related uh, to the Laplace transform. Um, and here we'll just kind of show the two-sided version for both. Um, so X of Z is the Z transform plugged into the definition. Um, if we define X S of T um, as uh, the sum of these samples of the x of t, so the discrete x of n's, times a delta function. So we replace these finite height um, samples uh, with a delta function whose weight is the same as the corresponding sample. Um, <clears throat> now this is a continuous time function. Uh, so this is plotted with t, and it corresponds to our x of n. So we just call it x s of t. We can take the Laplace transform of that XS of T, um, which is uh, just plugged into the definition now of Laplace, uh, replacing uh, X of T with its uh, summation form as a sum of delta functions. Well, each one of those delta functions uh, <clears throat> has this X of N multiplying it, but it's not a function of T, so we can pull those out front. And then I'm left with just the integral of a delayed delta function. The, the delta function's Laplace transform is one, and by the delay property, um, it's one times e to the minus s n t zero. Um, and so we see uh, that the Laplace transform of that sampled signal, uh, where the samples are replaced by delta functions, um, <clears throat> has the exact same form comparing uh, this final result for the continuous time with the definition of the Z transform. If I just replace Z by E to the S T zero, and then take that uh, to the uh, minus nth power, uh, we see that we get the exact same uh, term as we do in the Laplace transform of X of S. So the relationship between this sampled spectrum and <clears throat> X of Z uh, is uh, simply found by replacing Z by E to the ST zero, and they will uh, be equal. Um, <clears throat> so um, where is E to the ST zero uh, when we're talking about S equals J omega uh, T sub S? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, that would correspond uh, to points uh, on the unit circle. Um, and uh, since e to the j theta is a point on the unit circle, uh, the angle uh, would be oh, omega t s. Um, and so this sh shows, uh, excuse me, omega t zero, the uh, sample period. And so, <clears throat> uh, this says that uh, those points correspond uh, to e to the j omega, our discrete time frequency, corresponds to the frequency points uh, e to the j omega t zero. And here we see that relationship again um, between the discrete time frequency and the continuous time frequency. 
excuse me, remove the J, omega equals uh, omega T zero. And so, um, <clears throat> again, we see that the Fourier transform or the frequency response of the sampled signal um, corresponds to points on the unit circle here for the um, Fourier transform, um, where now the angle of, uh, of, the, of a point on the unit circle, the angle of the point on the unit circle with respect to the real axis corresponds to the discrete time frequency, uh, lowercase omega, and also equals uh, the continuous time frequency omega times t0. Um, and so uh, Laplace transform uh, is related to the Z transform through this picture where we replace the samples, uh, the, the discrete time samples of finite uh, value by the impulses of infinite height, but area determined by the weight. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the Z transform, H of Z, defines the discrete time frequency response H of omega, since we saw that this uh, angle uh, on the unit circle corresponds to the discrete time frequency. Um, H of omega, of course, is, uh, as we saw, the discrete time Fourier transform. Um, and so uh, we just can define now the discrete time Fourier transform is just the Z transform replacing Z by E to the J omega. Um, <clears throat> since uh, the sampled spectrum, um, uh, HS of S, um, equals uh, hz, h of z at z equals e to the st0. Um, we can make the connection uh, all the way to a corresponding uh, sampled function um, where hs of j omega um, is a Laplace transform evaluated at frequency j capital omega um, equals h of z at z equals e to the j discrete time frequency which can also be replaced by omega t0. And so now we have the connection uh, between uh, the, the Z transform, the points on the unit circle of the Z transform correspond to the discrete time Fourier transform, uh, which of course tie all the way back to the uh, sampled spectrum uh, HS of J omega. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, H of omega is periodic uh, on omega because it corresponds to the degree discrete time for a transform. It's periodic with period two pi. Um, and we saw that is true of the discrete time for a transform. Um, when we saw the discrete time for a transform, of course, we plotted the repetitions of the spectra like so, and it repeats every two pi. Uh, <clears throat> well, the same thing can be explained. Um, that the unit circle um, comes back to the same value every time you rotate an angle by a factor of two pi. And so uh, that interpretation in the Z plane is that going uh, around the unit circle every two pi, um, you see the same value. So again, H of omega interpreted where omega is the angle on the unit circle in the Z plane um, corresponds to the um, periodicity of two pi. Um, <clears throat> finally, um, uh, this is also shown that um, the um, J omega corresponds to the boundary right in the Laplace plane uh, between, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it's the boundary in the Laplace plane. It's the the uh, vertical axis, which corresponds to the Fourier transform. Um, and it's the boundary between stable and unstable poles. Uh, we'll see that the uh, unit circle corresponds to the boundary uh, in the Z plane for discrete time systems. Um, and it corresponds, as we see right here, to the discrete time Fourier transform. And it's the boundary between stable and unstable poles that we'll see later. 
Um, so we'll just do an example, um, Z transform and discrete time for a transform. So we'll let X of N be uh, four ones, uh, but zero everywhere else. Um, so just shorthand notation, four ones. Um, and just take the Z transform of this. And so uh, I replace X of N by one and the summation for non-zero values becomes zero to three. We can use the uh, formula for alpha to the n again. And so, uh, so this is some zero to three. So we get one minus z to the minus four. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, this is alpha to the n, uh, where I'm assuming I have z to the minus one to the nth power. And so I get z to the minus four and z to the minus one on the denominator using the formula, uh, summation formula. Uh, <clears throat> the region of convergence um, is uh, the region for which the uh, Z transform uh, exists. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, we can see that uh, this sum exists um, for uh, values of Z um, where Z is not equal to zero because uh, we can rewrite this slightly. Uh, this will be uh, 1 plus 1 over z plus 1 over z squared plus 1 over z cubed. And we can see that as long as z is not 0, uh, this sum is going to be finite. So the region of convergence is everywhere except 0, <clears throat> just by writing out uh, this summation explicitly. Um, <clears throat> So uh, if we want to find the frequency response, um, we want to find x of omega. So that's again x of z on the unit circle at angle omega. So we replace z by e to the j omega. And we see that we have the same uh, situation that we saw before. So uh, we can split the exponent and solve uh, in terms of sine. And so uh, here below, we split the exponent. We bring the phase term up front. Um, and so we'll see 2j sine of 2 omega when we split the 4 omega exponent and 2j sine omega over 2 when we split the denominator exponent. Uh, the 2j's will cancel. Uh, and so we'll just be left with a phase term up front. But if we're just looking at the magnitude, the magnitude of e to the j any angle is 1. And so all we're left with is sine of two omega over omega over two. If we want to find the DC response, we remember for small angles, uh, sine of theta is approximately equal to theta. So for small angle, I just have two omega over omega over two equals four. And so uh, that is the peak value uh, of the uh, response at omega equals zero. Uh, <clears throat> as before, um, we like to see where this will go through zero. Um, and so two omega must equal some multiple of pi. And so, uh, <clears throat> sorry, not two pi, but two omega um, equals some multiple of pi. So omega equals n pi over two. And so um, we'll see zero crossings at pi over two. Um, uh, I should have used a different variable, maybe m pi over 2, to distinguish it from our, our index n. And so <clears throat> it will repeat, uh, go through 0 pi over 2, and at pi. And of course, uh, we don't need to go any further, right, because this will periodically repeat. Um, it also goes to 0 at minus pi over 2. And again, this function is periodic, as we know. It repeats every 2 pi. And so we could just continue it out. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, DC response is four. Um, <clears throat> before I leave this, um, we could have calculated the DC response um, using our understanding of the unit circle. Um, so recall that the unit circle um, is one minus one J minus J. And at the angle with which uh, 
the, the angle to the uh, horizontal axis determines omega. And when the angle is zero, that's DC. And that would correspond to the point Z equals one. Another way to see that um, is Z equals E to the J omega when omega equals zero, Z equals one. And so um, when Z equals one, that's the DC value um, of the system. And so um, I could have done that substitution here um, and just solved for the DC value when Z equals one. And I can see by inspection uh, that I get the sum of ones, four ones. Uh, another way to see that is at DC, I have Z to the minus N, or I have one to the minus N. And so the DC value of anything is just the sum of the X of N's. And in our case, we have four ones. And so the DC value should be four. Um, that's an easy check. Um, and uh, uh, this is a good example to see that. Um, <clears throat> other things to see are the location of poles and zeros in the Z plane for this example. Uh, this was a little bit tricky. Um, and so um, it's easier. Uh, you can work in powers of Z to the minus one. I find it easier to work in powers of Z. So I just multiply top and bottom by Z to the fourth. And uh, in that case, uh, we can factor this out and see that we have Z cubed times Z to the minus one and Z to the four minus one. Uh, the solution to the top are the four roots of one. So this is a common and useful thing. Uh, the four roots of one are the four uh, points on the unit circle whose angle quadruple brings you back to one. And just by inspection, uh, I'll show one of the roots would be here. Uh, this angle is 40 as 90 degrees. And if I quadruple that angle, of course, it brings me back to one. Um, if I add any multiple of 90 degrees to that first solution, that's like adding an extra 360 since it also gets quadrupled. And so if I add an extra 90 degrees to this solution brings me uh, to this point. And if I quadruple this angle, um, here's the first point that comes back to 360, then comes back to 180 again. And finally, if I quadruple, it brings it back to, to one. Um, and so it's easy to find the four roots of of j, excuse me, four roots of one, um, and they correspond to one minus one j and minus j. So this is the factorization in the numerator. And so what we see here is we actually have a pole zero cancellation. And so that the poles and zeros of this, uh, or there's only uh, three zeros, and those three zeros are as drawn here. Uh, they're at uh, j minus one, and minus j. There is no uh, pole or zero at this uh, at z equals one. Um, <clears throat> finally, we know the region of convergence was z not equal to zero. And so uh, their only pole is at z equals zero. The pole at z equals one disappeared because of the pole zero uh, cancellation. Um, <clears throat> Finally, when you talk about region of convergence, normally in a pole zero plot, uh, you'll include the region of convergence by this hatched region, which kind of shows the entire Z plane except Z equals zero. Um, the function converges. By converging again, we mean it's not infinite. Clearly, we can see that here when we write out the Z transform. The only place where this is infinite is at Z equals zero. Uh, so I have a triple pole at z equals zero. Um, another example is a unit step. So of course, the unit step starts at zero and has a value one uh, there thereafter. And so <clears throat> just plug into the definition. So now we have some zero to infinity of u of n, which is nothing but one. Um, and uh, we have z to the minus n. So we have 1 minus z to the infinity over 1 minus z to the 1. So the region of convergence uh, must be values of z greater than 1. Um, uh, in that case, um, 
if uh, z is larger than one, z to the minus infinity is going to be zero. This piece disappears. And so I'm left with, uh, for magnitude of z greater than one, is one over one minus z to the minus one, or uh, oftentimes in powers of z, z over z minus one. Uh, another way to write this, multiply top and bottom by z. Um, and so uh, we have a region of convergence. We have a z transform. Um, and uh, again, the region of a convergence is the area where x of z is bounded. Um, so there could be a question, oh, what about z equals 1? Well, it's easy to prove that at z equals 1, we can find uh, that the z transform is clearly not bounded there, because if I expand the z transform at z equals 1, I have the sum of 1 from 0 to infinity and an unbounded answer. So it is indeed z greater than one, z equals one, is not part of the region of convergence. And so uh, the inequality is necessary. Um, <clears throat> another example, important example, is a real exponential uh, sequence. Um, and so uh, this should be very similar to RC filter. If you remember, an RC filter has a exponential decay. Um, so an exponential sequence uh, would look very similar, just samples of that exponential decay. So a to the n u of n uh, in the case where a was real. Um, in a complex value, we saw that these could be sinusoids. But for now, let's just consider uh, a, <clears throat> uh, just for purposes of illustration above when a was real, it looks a lot like an RC response. So. <clears throat> Uh, we just plug this into the Z-transform definition, um, where the U of N means it's causal, so that summation is now become zero to infinity. Um, and uh, to make this uh, fit into our formula of uh, alpha to the N, uh, we merge together uh, the A to the N and the Z to the minus N to uh, one term to the nth power. And so now we can use the formula and uh, we can see that uh, when the term in the parentheses here is less than uh, one, uh, then we'll have a, uh, uh, <clears throat> a converging uh, numerator. Um, so uh, looking at this, um, so a z to the minus one is the same as a over z. And so uh, when z is greater than the magnitude of z is greater than the magnitude of a, uh, then this numerator converges and the answer is 1 over 1 minus a z to the minus 1. Uh, so here we have a region of convergence uh, and the value for x of z. Outside this region, of course, um, it's undefined. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if z equals a, um, so we would like to check, does, is this strictly greater than? Uh, if we plug in z equals a, notice that we have the same situation as before, sum of 0 to infinity uh, of 1s. And so indeed, it has to be z greater than a. z equals a is not um, in the region of convergence. Um, and so if A was real valued, it would be, um, so this is a po pole location. So let's uh, rewrite this once again. Um, if we multiply top and bottom, we have Z over Z minus A um, <clears throat> for A to the N uh, U of N. And so uh, this will have a pole at Z equals A. If it's a real value, the pole would be on the real axis. Um, if it's a complex value, uh, then the pole will be at some uh, magnitude uh, of A at some angle. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, for the simple case where A is just a real number, 0.9, uh, A to the N U of N, uh, in this case um, would be the sequence 1.9.81, so a well-behaved exponential decaying sequence. Uh, here A would be 0.9, which is approximately drawn here uh, on the axis. Uh, and the region of convergence would be magnitude of Z greater than 0.9. And so this hashed region at the outside of that circle 
um, would denote the region of convergence. Note also that the, the pole location is on the boundary. And if we remember the uh, pole is an indication of an infinite point. And so um, that cannot be in the region of convergence because convergence means the answer has a finite value. Uh, this is typical um, that you will find a pole on the boundary uh, where the region of convergence is. <clears throat> so um, we just had an example of a uh, Z-transform and a region of convergence. And when we introduced the two-sided Z-transform, we said <clears throat> the uh, X of Z was not sufficient. I had to combine it with a region of convergence. So we'll see a an example here that illustrates um, uh, a two-sided transform where two parts of the Z transform have the exact same form, uh, but they have different regions of convergence. And so uh, this will be an example as to why region of convergence is needed. Um, <clears throat> and so again, uh, ROC is required for the two-sided transform, and we'll primarily use a two-sided transform because this is the most common transform uh, in digital systems and digital signal processing. Um, <clears throat> and so convergence is a Z transform, um, again, is, uh, is the primary uh, concern of the region of convergence. The region of convergence shows the finite value or converging uh, regions of X of Z. And so if we write out the uh, function for X of Z, um, <clears throat> the sum of x of n, z to the minus n, from minus infinity to infinity, again, two-sided. Uh, this is less than or equal to the sum of the magnitudes. And so just as a simple argument, I could have positive and negative values. But if I take the absolute value or magnitude, then the sum <clears throat> has to be less than uh, the sum of the absolute values. Um, <clears throat> the abs the uh, magnitude. Um, is the product of the two magnitudes. Um, and we can take the z to the minus n uh, magnitude is one over the magnitude of z to the n. And so uh, for this to converge means that the uh, value must be less than infinity. And so using these inequalities, um, <clears throat> we have a different form uh, showing uh, the uh, bound in terms of magnitudes of the sequence and magnitudes of z. Now we want to replace z by its polar coordinates, r e to the j theta. And so uh, what we're doing, uh, again, if we have the unit circle, uh, let's say an angle theta, um, the radius now can be any radius. And so this vector would be r e to the j theta, where r would be the magnitude or length of that vector with angle theta. So uh, when we plug this into the uh, inequalities above, um, we can uh, express the summation uh, in, a, in two pieces. Uh, the first piece um, uh, being for the uh, negative indices, and so minus infinity to uh, minus 1. And so in that case, we just change the sign from 1 to infinity and flip the sign of the exponent. Um, and so <clears throat> r to the minus n uh, for the negative indices becomes r to a positive. And so this first one's for the negative indices. Uh, and then for the positive indices, we have the same form uh, as we had above. And so the sum of these two right, must be uh, bounded. Uh, the left side um, converges uh, for values uh, R less than some maximum value, which we'll call R negative. Um, it's the radius associated with um, the negative indices, the minus values of N. Um, and so uh, as R gets smaller, or as the magnitude of R gets smaller, um, that would improve the convergence of R to the positive powers. On the other hand, uh, the right side of the sequence, or the, the uh, portion of the sequence for uh, n greater than or equal to 0, 
um, <clears throat> to the right of the sequence x of n converges for values of r greater than some r positive. Um, again, the plus indicates that it's the uh, radius associated with the positive indices n in the original sequence x of n. And so here, as r gets bigger, of course, uh, that tends to improve the convergence on the right side. And so we see two fundamental different behaviors. Uh, the left side of the sequence uh, likes to converge for uh, values less than some radius, and the right side of the sequence tends to converge for values uh, greater than some radius. Uh, <clears throat> and so um, if we look at um, the two-sided sequence again, uh, this uh, portion associated with the negative indices, uh, or the left side of the sequence, um, would be all the indices for n, uh, where n is negative. Uh, it converges uh, for values uh, inside some radius, uh, which we denoted r negative. Uh, the right side of the sequence uh, converges for values greater than some r positive. And so, <clears throat> Um, for both sides uh, to be bounded, um, it would have to be a region that would lie in between these two bounds. And so this is the hash region, and so these two-sided sequences have these ring-like um, uh, regions of convergence with the outer bound determined by the left, -sided, left side of the sequence um, and the, uh, the inner boundary determined uh, by the right side of the sequence. And so <clears throat> that's just a, a simple property of rearranging the bounds on the sum of x of z. So uh, to do a concrete example, let's consider a particular value x of n is uh, a to the n u of n. So that's a right-sided sequence. It multiplies u of n. And so that's uh, typical of the sequences of the exponential decays starting at 0 and going to the right. Um, and b to the n uh, u of minus n minus 1 is a left sided sequence. And um, <clears throat> uh, it's an exponential sequence uh, going to the left. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so uh, we can rewrite this whole summation uh, for this x of n noting that uh, this left-sided sequence only um, exists uh, for uh, values of n uh, less than or equal to minus 1. We can check that real quickly. Uh, when n equals minus 1, we notice that we have, uh, excuse me here, u of 0, uh, which is 1. When n equals minus 2, uh, we have u of 1, which um, is also a value 1. And so this u of minus n minus 1, if you sketch it, um, is a left going step starting at minus 1, minus 2, and so forth, plotted on n. And so uh, this u of, uh, min u of minus n minus 1 uh, is the left side of the sequence because it multiplies um, the b, b to the nth power. Also, just note quickly that n uh, in that left side of the sequence is a negative value. And so uh, we would actually have a sequence um, b to the minus 1, uh, b to the minus 2, associated with these uh, negative values of n for this left side of the sequence. So <clears throat> at any rate, um, we Note that the negative indices, we pull those to the left because the u of minus n minus 1 is 0 to the right. And then we can pull the uh, a to the n portion of the sequence uh, for uh, values of n greater than or equal to 0 since u of n uh, causes that sequence uh, to be 0 to the left. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what we need to do is just to uh, rewrite uh, the sequence on the left slightly and make it a sequence going from zero to infinity, uh, noting that uh, when we have this index here at zero, I have uh, uh, 
b to the minus 1 for the first value and z to the 1, and we'll double check, um, I would have uh, b to the minus 1, z to the 1, coming up and checking with the sequence where the indices were negative. And so uh, we just rewrote the summation uh, from 0 to infinity and left the second summation the same as it was. Uh, <clears throat> we can also pull out a factor, b to the minus 1z, uh, and then just uh, deal with uh, a term to the nth power, uh, which would be b to the minus 1z to the n. And the same way on the right-hand side, I have az to the minus 1 to the n. Um, so using the summation formula, um, we, we can uh, find uh, the result for the infinite sums. And again, um, the region of convergence is um, set by these. And so we have to have um, z greater than a, the magnitude of z greater than a for this uh, to the infinite power to be 0. Otherwise, uh, it's unbounded. And similarly here, uh, we have to have magnitude of z less than b, because I have z over b here, uh, for the uh, left side of the sequence to be bounded when it's taken to the infinite power. And so under those two conditions, uh, z uh, less than b and z greater than a, then the total z transform uh, becomes this. Um, and so <clears throat> multiplying through by the uh, uh, by b z to the minus 1 on the numerator and denominator um, on the left hand side I end up with my final result below both these x of z's have the exact same form as a matter of fact if a equals b um, I cannot tell the left side of the sequence from the right side of the sequence the only way to tell the left side sequence is it was associated with the region of convergence uh, z magnitude of z less than the uh, boundary magnitude b and the right side of the sequence had a magnitude of z greater and so in this case let's say <clears throat> a and b uh, were real numbers and so uh, they would lie on the real axis and so the right-sided sequence z greater than uh, magnitude of a, so here's my uh, value of a, and so the right side of the sequence would have a region of convergence that would go outward to infinity. However, the left side of the sequence is bounded by b, and it has a region of convergence that's an interior region. And so it would just be this, uh, uh, the circle uh, of radius b and would have the full interior. However, the full region of convergence, both sides have to be bounded and so it becomes this ring uh, that we see um, <clears throat> and so uh, here we have uh, you know an example of a two-sided exponential sequence to the left and to the right um, where we can see that exponential form uh, and so this would be a two-sided sequence which would have this ring-like uh, region of convergence So the important thing to see here um, at the very bottom is that there are two sequences that have the same Z transform. And the only way to tell which of the two sequences there are are by the, by the region of convergence, either being an interior region or an exterior region. Um, <clears throat> and so a uh, two-sided example, um, let B equals 2 and a equals one half. Um, and so um, I would have on a right-sided sequence, I would have one half to the n u of n. And on the left side, I would have uh, two to the minus n. And so if I go to the right side, uh, a to the n u of n, I would have one for n equals zero. Uh, for n equals one, I would have one half. For n equals 2, I'd have a quarter. On the left side of the sequence, with b equals 2, I would have 2 to the minus 1 on the left, which would be 1 half. 2 to the minus 2 for n equals minus 2, 1 quarter, and so forth. And you can 
sketch that out. Um, so using the example we had before. Um, <clears throat> and so um, the form of the uh, Z transform um, was the solution that we had on the previous page, Z over Z minus B or Z over Z minus A. And so we just substitute for B and A. Uh, if we want to list this that as a polynomial with numerator and denominator and find the zeros, um, we group together um, the Z minus A, Z minus B, and multiply, uh, cross multiply for the numerators. Um, and so if you work on the details, um, you get uh, <clears throat> this result and substituting uh, for the A's and the B's, um, you get uh, Z minus a half, Z minus two. And then now we have uh, the, the location of the zeros um, set by the numerator. So we have a zero at Z equals zero uh, and another zero at Z equals 1.25 set by the second term. So I have two zeros. And so now I have the poles and zeros uh, for this function. Uh, in the Z plane where I have real part of Z and imaginary part of Z. And notice that the boundary of the region of convergence uh, is two at the outside. Uh, and for the inner uh, right-sided uh, boundary is set by one half at the middle. Um, <clears throat> and so this is the causal or right-sided portion of the sequence sets the inner pole. Um, so this is actually a very well-behaved sequence. Uh, at some time later, we'll point out um, that this is a stable two-sided sequence because the region of convergence does include the unit circle uh, because the two boundaries are one half and two, and that includes the radius one. Uh, so this is actually a stable system because of uh, including the unit circle. Um, and so we could take many Z transforms, but typically the approach is similar to Laplace. Um, and so um, uh, of interest quite often is to do the sample signal and see what the associated uh, Laplace and Z transforms are. So the delta function we cannot do in terms of the Dirac delta function. It's Laplace transform is one but we can't, uh, we can't <clears throat> digitize a delta function because it has infinite bandwidth and would violate Nyquist and would be aliased. Um, however, uh, unit step indeed we can uh, digitize. Um, and so the unit step has a Laplace transform one over S, uh, but if I digitize the unit step, um, it would have a, uh, sample uh, u of n. The z transform u of n is z over z minus one, it has a pole of one, so it's region of convergence magnitude of z greater than one. We mentioned that this is the accumulator and integrator, and we can see um, that they be, behave similarly, and that you have a pole at zero in the Laplace, so it's unstable. You have a pole at one, uh, the boundary for stable poles in the z plane, is the unit circle because that corresponds to the frequency axis of the discrete time Fourier transform. Um, and this sits on the boundary uh, at z equals one. Um, and so we can repeat other uh, signals. Uh, so if we have one over s squared, that's a ramp t u of t. Um, that would correspond to um, samples uh, at intervals of t sub s. And so uh, the values would be n times t sub s times u of n. And so it also has a z transform. And we see similarly, so digitizing the exponential, uh, we have an exponential on z. And so uh, <clears throat> uh, what we uh, typically have used is a to the n u of n. And here our value of a would be e to the minus a t s. And so uh, this served the value of a when we were 
uh, digitizing a to the n u of n. Um, <clears throat> but the same result and so forth, we can take more z transforms, fill up the z transform table. And so when we're dealing with z transforms, of course, we don't do the contour integral. Once we have a z transform, we use the table, lookup table, to find the corresponding sequence uh, x of n. So uh, z transform has properties, just as Laplace and Fourier.